It's uh, my great pleasure, uh, well, this afternoon, uh, to uh, welcome uh, Naomi Yamada from Meiji University, uh, who's giving uh, her talk, uh, Changing Approaches to Positive Discrimination in Education in China. And I think that maybe I will just uh, leave it with this short introduction so that I don't take away from her time. Very happy to be here. And I want to especially thank Dr. Nathan Hill for inviting me. So the title of my talk today is Changing Approaches to Positive Discrimination in Education in China. Um, and, and in China, as in almost every multi-ethnic nation state, there's inequalities in education that correspond to ethnicity. Um, so the Yohei Jansu, the preferential policies are a kind of positive discrimination system, um, which means that special measures are available for certain groups so that there can be greater general equality. That's, that's the idea. But as with affirmative action in the United States, the preferential policies have long been criticized within the country. And there is an imagined end point when they are no longer needed. That may be sooner rather than later. I'll be talking about um, China's preferential policy measures in higher education and some of the connected debates or discourses. So first I'll just briefly sketch out a general framework of some of the policy measures and then talk about the logic for their implementation and for some of uh, the current undoing. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Okay, so Yohei Jiangsu preferential policy measures in higher education can refer to a couple things. One, score adjustments on the Gaokao, the National College Entrance Exam. And these are often called bonus points or jiafen by uh, colloquially. They're most widely known in connection with um, minority students, Xiao Shu Min Zhu but they're also given to some other categories of students like um, the children of martyrs, um, and to overseas Chinese students. And not all minority students have been eligible for these added points on the Gaokao. There have always been annual changes to the policies that affect which group and region are eligible. But minority focused point provisions for the Gaokao are in the process of being reduced and discontinued in, um, throughout China, in prefectures and provinces throughout China. Um, and the preferential policies can also refer to, to the national system of preparatory classes, the Yukaban, for minority students uh, for higher education. And that was the primary focus of my dissertation research long ago. Um, students can enter the preparatory program with lower scores than needed for direct entrance to university. And then after a one or two year program, they can proceed to the affiliated university without retaking the entrance exam. And only minorities are eligible for UCA, theoretically. There's a lot of stories about, um, about fake minorities, but I, I never met anybody who admitted to, to that status. Um, the two largest represented groups in China over the past 70 years that have been eligible have been the Tibetans and Uyghurs. Um, depending on where they live. So in Qinghai province, where I primarily was, the two largest affected minority groups were the Tibetans and the Hui. And there were smaller groups like the Salar and the Mongolians who also were part of the Yukaban. Um, there's other preferential policies that concern tax, tax revenues and have concerned family planning, but, but I've been focused on higher education. So I published a book at the end of last year connected to the preferential policies for higher ed, uh, mainly focusing on the um, preparatory program. And in my research, um, I found that these policies have been um, understood and rhetorically, um, they're, they're talked about as important for managing ethnic-based contradictions. Because I'm from the US, the frame of reference I have of positive discrimination apart from preferential policies in China is affirmative action. Um, and interestingly, there was an important edited volume that came out in 2009 called Affirmative Action in China and the US. So some people choose to translate Yohei Jiangsu as affirmative action in English. There's a different basis um, for these systems, for the positive discrimination systems. And the term affirmative action doesn't accurately 
describe the measures in China, but calling it this makes the topic more accessible to, to people um, outside of China. So after all, there are similarities in the types of complaints that members of non-eligible groups have. Many Hanzu, many in the Han majority object to these measures, saying that they are unfair. And this is very similar to the reverse discrimination discourses that come up with reference to affirmative action. Um, and if you're from China, if any of you are from China, you probably know there's a widespread perception that minorities have extra benefits. I've never met anyone in China who hasn't heard about the score adjustments, um, the added points, the jiafen. In my own writing, I call them point provisions because sometimes what people call jiafen refers instead to the lowering of the cutoff score and not to adding points on top. Um, <clears throat> so I just say point provisions. At any rate, the adjusted scores on the Gaokao are well known. Fewer people are aware of the Yukaban, but the preferential policies are often raised in response to criticisms of China's treatment of minority peoples. Um, I was asked by the China Journal to review um, a book called from Empire to Nation State Ethnic Politics in China, which was published last year by Cambridge. And the author of the book, Sun Yen, really painted a picture of extensive ethnic based prerogatives. And in describing some of the preferential policies, the author talked about reverse discrimination and blamed the policies for exacerbating ethnic tensions. And what she said really represents a, a common discourse in China. Um, one argument she makes is that the extension of these policy measures to Xiaoshu Minzu, to minority peoples, facilitates politicized ethnic identities that are destabilizing to the Chinese state. And this argument that she makes follows from and builds on an argument made by uh, Peking University professor of sociology, Ma Rong, who controversially argued in 2004 about the need to, um, quote, depoliticize ethnic identities by cultivating a common civic identity, a common kind of superordinate um, identity and dismantling ethnic-based preferential policies. So I'll come back to his argument a little bit later. Um, about the preparatory program, in 2018, there were 7.9 million students entering college, regular higher educational institutes. And um, in the same year in China, there were 44,429 students enrolled in preparatory programs for higher ed. So it's a, it's a relatively small program. Um, and criticism of the preferential policy measures is not new, um, but I think it's important to note they don't that that this program doesn't actually affect that many people. It's a, it's a pretty small provision, um, but these programs have carried on in some form in the face of criticism over generations, um, with the exception of the Cultural Revolution. The philosophical framework of the program hasn't changed significantly in its seventy-year history, even though the content and the organization and the fee structure have all changed. Um, but the program is still talked about in terms of development. Um, and the idea is that if there's development, it will bring various ethnic groups into parity and prevent these contradictions that could, you know, destabilize the country. Um, and the Courses have a history going back to the early years of the People's Republic of China, the early 50s, with stated goals of recruiting minority cadres and encouraging economic and political development of minority areas. While recruiting cadres is not such a main focus now, administrators still explain the program in terms of preparing rural minority students for Chinese higher education. So it's supposed to be a year with um, kind of reinforcement of high school, high school, uh, what they learned in high school, and then um, they can go on to college. Some of them may need help with Mandarin if their first language is 
Tibetan or Uyghur or, or well, I was going to say Korean, but actually the Koreans don't have, um, they don't attend Yukaban. They do, they have been receiving Jiaofen. No. Um, a, an assumed corollary is that it will lead to a reduction of tensions and contradictions. So this was on the Ministry of Education website. I checked today, it's still there. It was written in 2005. Um, and this is uh, a translation, my translation. Preparatory classes and nationality specific classes held in ordinary higher educational institutions are special policy measure by which the party and country can speed up the training of people of special talent from minority regions. This is the higher educational institutions utmost responsibility and duty. Um, anyway, it goes on to say that um, it, it uh, promotes stability and sustainable development in minority areas, strengthens ethnic solidarity and safeguards the country's unity. Um, so at first glance, it's hard to understand the connection between safeguarding the country's unity and classes for minority students. And the training of minority individuals is linked to their eventual contribution to home regions and autonomous prefectures, which is linked to development and interethnic co uh, cooperation, which is linked to an absence of conflict or threats to the state. So um, the mass internments in Xinjiang, which I first heard of in 2017, seemed like a departure from the policy logic of accommodating diversity in the interests of development and stability. Um, the diversity efforts seem to have given way to um, a, a, new, a new method, um, a promotion of sameness, monolingualism, um, anti-alternate, belief systems in order to achieve some kind of um, unity. And at the same time, there's um, discontinuation of teaching in minority languages. So in Qinghai, there were proposals a decade ago to um, stop teaching in um, Tibetan content and language classes in Tibetan and to stop translating textbooks in Tibetan. But there were protests at the time and um, the end point was delayed. Um, it was, it was it, it, they didn't follow through on their end point of, which was I think 2020. But um, in Xinjiang, um, there has been discontinuation of teaching in Uyghur and in Jilin, um, the Ming Kalmin, the, the students who want to test in, um, you take the Gaokao in Korean, for example, that will be canceled as of 2026. And some of the Korean classes are, are going to eventually be canceled as well, although they're still in operation now. Um, most of my time spent in China was in Qinghai province where I lived as an English teacher and later a grad student and researcher. And I was also at um, uh, Beijing Daoshui, Peking University for about five months. So Qinghai is in Northwest China on the Northeast portion of the Tibetan plateau. And you can see the Qinghai grassland be behind me. <laughs> I was first an English teacher for two years at uh, Qinghai Normal University in the late nineties from 1997 to 99. And some of my interlocutors have been familiar to me since that time. And then I renewed my affiliation from 2009 to 10 as a graduate student. And then I returned for follow-up trips to Qinghai in the summers of 2013 and 15 and to Beijing in um, 2017. The largest ethnic groups in Qinghai are Han, uh, Tibetan, Hui, Salar, Mongolian, and many students are eligible for preferential policies. Um, Qinghai is only second to um, the Tibetan Autonomous Region, Shizong Zizichu, in terms of low primary school enrollment uh, attendance and low childhood and adulthood literacy rates. Um, and while I was there as an anthropologist, I became interested in the um, how people talked about the preparatory program, the logic behind it, and by extension, the preferential policies. And I became interested in the rhetoric about the program and how it actually 
operated and how people affected by the policy of the teachers, the students, the potential students understood its purpose. Um, all right, so Ching has had significant representation in the preparatory program. This is a map um, that my husband helped me make and it shows the ratio of preparatory course slots to higher education institution slots. So every university in China, they have um, a set number of slots and they allocate these in very specific ways. Um, so <clears throat> there will be slots allocated from certain places for students from Qinghai province. Um, so if you look at this map, you can see that Qinghai and Ningxia are in, in black um, and they have uh, this show, the, they, they have the highest ratio here of preparatory class slots to HEI admission slots. HEI means higher education institution. So this includes four-year universities or two-year vocational schools but the ratio here for Qinghai is one to 17, meaning that there was one preparatory course slot designated for a student from Qinghai for every 17 slots for higher education. This is back in 2010. And then if you look at only regular four-year undergraduate admission, the ratio is even higher. So it's one to 6.7. So this was the highest ratio of any administrative unit in China, meaning that one undergraduate tracked preparatory class slot was allocated to a student from Qinghai for every 6.73 direct admission undergraduate slots for students from, from Qinghai for Benke. Um, so the previous slide was Benke and Zhuangke vocational school and um, regular higher education institution. This is just for four-year colleges. Um, by way of, and Ningxia had the second highest allocation. Okay, if I'm, I'm losing you, um, the point is that um, there aren't options to go to college from other places via this route if you have lower scores. So this will add a year or two to your education, but you can use the slot, you can get in with a slightly lower score, and then you don't have to retake the the Gaokao, you can just continue at your institution. Um, so by way of contrast, there were no Yuka slots for Gaokao examinees from Beijing. Um, and one thing that is important to note about slot allocation, they're allocated for students based on the province or autonomous region they come from, but the allocated slots for those students um, are from all over China. So the slots are allocated for students from Qinghai, but the students don't all attend uh, Yukaban, the preparatory course in Qinghai. So um, although there are Yukaban in Beijing, like the Zhongyao um, Minzu Dashui, the Minzu University of China, no one from Beijing attends Yukaban. And there's a good reason for this as students in Beijing have greater educational access. Okay, so by 2016, more slots were allocated for students from the Tibetan Autonomous Region and from Xinjiang. And this can be seen in this map. You can see these giant uh, black areas now. So that's one strategy for educational equality to open more slots up for students from the West. Um, but this data is difficult to interpret because the Ministry of Education didn't include in their public information the number of slots for study within these two regions. So this presumably affected the total allocations for, um, <clears throat> for other provinces as well. So that is if there were slots within these autonomous regions allocated for students from other provinces to study, they didn't appear in the data. Um, so for, for example, I'm almost done with this point, but um, for example, in 2016, uh, Beijing Foreign Studies University had two slots allocated for, I'm sorry, I just realized that, okay, two slots allocated for students from Qinghai province out of 35 allocated in total for a Yuka. The total number of allocations 
four Qinghai students from a variety of tertiary institutions across China, including Beijing Foreign Studies University and institutions within Qinghai added up to 1,695. So 1,695 slots for students from Qinghai. However, institutions in the Tibetan Autonomous Region and Xinjiang were simply not listed. Although slots allocated for students from the Tibetan Autonomous Region and Xinjiang and institutions across China are listed. So we can see um, that there are slots open for them to go to other provinces, but we don't know how many slots they have in their own um, areas. So the allocating of spots for students from the West is one way to ensure greater access to education, but it also means that they're leaving, they're leaving their homes. Um, it's less common for students from Qinghai to have inland classes, Nadi Ban, and uh, Yukuban for lower levels like junior high and high school, than for students from Xinjiang and from the Tibetan Autonomous Region. But Qinghai comes out as having one of the highest ratios of Gaokao examinees who are allocated spots in Yukuban for tertiary education. Um, and these measures and provisions do enable students to compete on a more equal basis when faced with a national curriculum developed in the East. But it also seems to indicate a pessimism about the prospects of building excellent educational facilities in the West. Um, and although more slots are opened for them, multi-ethnic provinces and autonomous regions underperform the national average for students who go on to tertiary education overall. So there's just less students who will go on to college or vocational school. For people who test in other languages, the Min Kao Min, take the Gao Kao in another language, there are typically zero slots allocated for them at prestigious schools like uh, Beida or Tsinghua or any prestigious universities apart from um, Minzu universities, ethnic minority universities, or teaching universities, normal universities, Shifan Dashi. <clears throat> There's a persistence of educational disparities that start at the level of elementary school in minority areas, particularly in Western regions, Qinghai, Gansu, Xinjiang, and the Tibetan Autonomous Region. Um, these are just a couple pictures from a school near Qinghai Lake. Probably this school is no longer open because there have been a number of school consolidations over the past decade um, to prefectural centers. The idea is that the students will have better facilities, but then again, they're farther away from their, their families. Um, they, they may have to board. So there's a stress on development, on regional development, as well as individual career and educational development. There's this idea that individuals can study and go back to their birthplace and help develop the area. Um, and that's, that's part of the logic behind the programs. But there's so much competition for university slots and people really go to extremes for extra points. You know, some will even move to different provinces for better test results. Those are the Gaokao uh, migrants, Gaokao Yimin. Although I think that that has pretty much been discontinued. For every strategy that individuals come up with, then there's a counter strategy um, <laughs> to prevent it through policy. So it goes to figure that many parties in China resent these programs that might give, um, you know, that might give more points to other students. Um, students in elementary schools in Tibetan autonomous prefectures in Qinghai, like, like, this, like this one, um, would be eligible for Yukban or point allocations. Um, the teacher here is reviewing the alphabet in Tibetan, mainly for my benefit, since it was too easy for the students. And you can see in this picture on the wall, there's a saying from um, Chairman Mao Zedong. Um, that, that basically says if you um, study well, then you can aspire to higher levels. And in between the saying is a, a picture of the 10th Panchen Lama. It was kind of an interesting, um, 
interesting connection of things. Um, so here is a um, vocational high school in Yushu. These are Tibetan students and they would be eligible for preferential policy measures. I actually took this picture right before the um, earthquake in Yushu. So um, this school that these students are a few months after I took this picture, there was an earthquake and the epicenter was at this school and the school was destroyed. Um, and then actually the one thing that the uh, Board of Education did was they actually um, allocated extra points for some of these students who had their education disrupted. Um, but some of the students at the school died. Um, <clears throat> so there's there are these gaps in education. There are well-meaning administrators who want to correct the gaps. At the same time, there's just this relentless competition to get into um, a good school, to get every point possible. So there's always this impetus to end and reform the preferential policies. Um, in 2015, um, a publication issued by the Ministry of Education and five other departments um, published some requirements related to radically adjusting Gaokao point provisions. And the same year, the head of the Ethnic Education Division of the Ministry of Education, um, Mao Liti, he said that the ultimate goal is definitely to have no added points. Um, but, but there's still no clear timetable for the cancellation. Um, <clears throat> however, since that time, um, across China, a, a number of, of provinces have canceled or restricted the um, Jiafen for ethnic minority students. So there have been, um, let's see, I just listed, okay. Sorry, from 2015, many provinces began to reduce and eliminate the extra points. Um, Shanxi, Shanxi, Hebei, Zhejiang, Guangdong, Hubei, Jiangxi um, have reduced, or actually I think all of those have canceled the extra points. Um, and then over the next five years from 2020, many provinces are year by year reducing with points in the next five years. So um, typically what they'll do is they'll start with, um, like if they have a 10 point allocation, they'll go down to five points. And then after a set number of years, they'll completely stop them. Um, so let's see some of those. Yeah, um, Guizhou from 2022 will adjust downward and then by 2026 eliminate them. And Jiangsu will eliminate the extra points um, for the, will eliminate the point provisions for the Gaokao for Shaoshu Minzu from this year. Um, let's see, Gansu is limiting the extra points to the Linxia area. Uh, Jilin, they'll be canceled entirely from 2023. Fujian is going from 10 to five points and they'll cancel the point provisions for ethnic minorities from 2025. Um, Liaoning is slated to eliminate them as well. So just across the board, there, there's more, but across the board, there is um, an elimination of these ethnic-based Gaokao points. The ones that remain are available to candidates from remote areas. And these are specified um, from the Ministry of Education as border areas, mountainous areas, pastoral areas, and ethnic minority regions. Bianjiang, Shanchu, Muchu, Xiaoshu Minzu, Juju Dichu. So places where uh, minorities live. Um, and then additionally, to get some of these points, the students have to show that they have kept their household registration and their school registration for a set number of years. Um, and part of the impetus of this is related to those old complaints about fraud, about um, Han um, posing as minority students and getting extra points or entering the um, Yukaban. So part of the impetus 
for changes to combat this change of minority status, taking on minority identity, not providing an incentive um, for this and, and to stop the Gaokao immigrants, to give them no incentive. All right. <clears throat> So another change that's happened um, over the past two decades relates to just the structure, the fee structures of universities. So with the UCABAN, with the preparatory programs, I had often heard that the programs were meant for development and to help the poor. But at the same time, some people said that the programs were for the rich. And so it was hard for me to understand this contradiction initially until I realized that over the past 15 to 20 years, the programs have shifted from being mainly government supported to being largely or self-funded by students, which seems to undermine the, the goal of aiding those in the most need. But the universities don't have a lot of choice as they're increasingly run like businesses and they're less supported by the state. In 1999, uh, higher education institutes in China were granted the status of legal persons the fees in Qinghai are still quite low, uh, but the students have to pay for an extra year or two if they go through the preparatory program. But that's still considered a benefit because it's preferable to, um, if you fail the Gaokao, you might have to pay for a year of cram school and you wouldn't have a guarantee of doing well on the Gaokao. And students who delay entry by a year are repeaters and not eligible for some schools. So there's just an immense, um, number of considerations. All right. Um, originally, when I began doing class observations and interviews, I thought that perhaps the preparatory program was supposed to provide a cultural bridge between rural secondary education and Chinese higher education. Um, and a description of the features of the preparatory program at uh, Qinghai Shida included a transitional quality, a guodushing. And there was mention of, of diversity of the students' backgrounds, um, the discrepancy in their cultural foundations, and the psychological characteristics, xinli tedian, which differ from the Han. But when I asked questions about whether there were different definitions of education, or if different teaching methods were used because of cultural differences, the teachers and the administrators would explain to me that everyone is part of the same country and the goals and definitions of education were determined by policy. And they stressed that the students lacked foundational knowledge and they said that they were, they were behind, jichu um, hencha. So the programs really have a remedial purpose and some students joke that they are gao si. So there's, there's three years of high school, um, gao yi, gao er, gao san. So gao si, the joke is it's the fourth year of high school. Um, the rhetoric in the program really touches on um, contradiction and positions the individual student as a kind of Minzu ambassador. So the subject in one of the classes I attended at the Yukaben at the preparatory um, campus was politics. And the teacher discussed the reunification of Macau and Hong Kong and the importance of Taiwan's eventual reunification. She also talked about America's meddling on this issue. Um, and, I, and I was surprised about that because I was usually the teachers will wait till I leave, um, but she, <laughs> she, she wanted to let me know. So then she shifted into a discussion about developing personal quality. And she pointed out that the students should be more tolerant of each other. And she said, without enough tolerance, um, it was easy to, uh, to, to engender contradictions. And if these were not quickly resolved, then they could become larger conflicts. At first, I couldn't understand the shift between national sovereignty and territorial claims and self-cultivation and interpersonal skills. But, um, but the topics touched on questions of nation and unity. So if outside forces are potentially creating chaos, then internal cooperation could, you know, bridge and minimize difference. Um, and it, I mean, it was just sitting in these classes that I learned about dialectical materialism. Um, but the teacher went on to tell the students that the country was multi-ethnic and multi-religious 
and the students represented different groups. And she said that, you know, the reason the students were able to be together in the classroom was because of the party and the country for the gift of this policy, which allowed the students to receive a higher education. And she said, you know, we should keep a grateful heart. We should thank the party and the country. So the courses and other preferential policy measures, they're, they're premised on development, on overcoming contradictions, and they link self-cultivation and personal development with national stability. Um, and then if you're in China, you know, you often can see banners everywhere with, with kind of uplifting messages or, or with dictates, <laughs> um, things you should do. <laughs> so, so here we have one that, that says, Shuo Wenming Hua, Xing Wenming Ju, Zuo Wenming Ren, like speak like a civilized person, um, you know, behave like a civilized person. Here, um, as another one, establish a consciousness of language norms, raise ethnic um, cultural quality. Shuli Yu Yang Guifan Yi Shi Ti Gao Min Zu Wen Hua Su Zhi. Um, <clears throat> all right. So I am going to come back right now to um, Maro, who I referenced a little bit earlier in the talk. Um, there is an effort to emphasize unity with the nation and um, to overcome contradictions. Um, and this relates to this discourse of politicized ethnic identities. So Maro is a sociologist at Beida at P uh, Peking University, and he has written extensively on minority and bilingual education. And he has linked um, preferential policies and Minzu-based educational offerings, um, minority-based educational offerings, such as the preparatory program and minority education. He's linked all these things with um, nationality consciousness. And this line of thinking is echoed by other education scholars as well. Um, so his idea is that if these students or these groups become too aware of themselves as nationalities, then they will think that they're at the same level as the state and there will be contradictions between them and between the state. Um, Ma's argument follows a logic of contradictions and it's generated debates and ideas that have been followed by academics and policymakers. Um, and I, I know that for some of us, um, we think, well, academics, nobody listens to academics. <laughs> and that's largely true. But in this case, um, in this case, some academics have been listened to very carefully um, and the policymakers have, have changed their approaches based on what they have said. So for example, this, uh, his argument influenced a call by uh, Hu Angang and, and Hu Lianhe for a second generation of ethnic policies, the Ardai Min Zhu Zhengzi, um, in 2011. And the second generation proposal from the two Hu's was less culturally sensitive than Ma's proposal. Um, you may recall it was Hu Lianhe who stood before the United Nations in August 2018 and stated there were no re-education centers in Xinjiang. Um, so he's been linked to policy shifts and detentions in Xinjiang. Um, the relationship between the logic of contradictions and ethnic policy in China, it's, it's illuminated by Ma's argument and the criticism it drew in second generation discourse. So, so Ma's reasoning is that the nationalities model in China was borrowed from the Soviet Union. Um, and that had the consequence of politicizing ethnic consciousness. He went on to say that the Soviet Union eventually split up along lines of ethnic nationalism and China would do well um, to ostensibly ensure against the same fate to consider changes to the conceptual model. Um, notably by changing terms and use from nationality or minzu to ethnic group or zuchuan and to shift from a minzu or nationality based model 
of ethnic policy to a, a depoliticized uh, to Zheng Zhihua or culturalist Wenhua Zhuyi model. And, and he thinks that the United States has a kind of culturalist model. So he depicts the United States as having one national superordinate level of culture under which there are lesser cultures. Um, that is, you know, ethnically expressed sub subcultures. And then he uses the expression one polity and many cultures, Zheng Zhi Ti Wenhua Duoyuan. Um, and this kind of expresses his understanding of the American model. But he additionally um, is linguistically signaling pioneering sociologist Fei Xiaodong's foundational vision of pluralist unity, which was Duoyuan Yi Ti. Um, so he's saying Zheng Zhi Yi Ti Wenhua Duoyuan. Uh, one polity and many cultures. And Fei Xiaodong's vision was Duo Yuan Yi Ti, pluralist unity. So he's reconfiguring the pairs the, of characters in Fei's expression to construct his own. So a counter narrative, however, um, takes it as a given that preferential policies and regional aut autonomy, even in a reduced capacity, don't accomplish this developmental and assimilative transformation. So according to this narrative, which relies on the policy ideal of equality and unity, preferential policies encourage um, contradictions. And Marong, who finds accordance with anthropological consensus on the point that ethnic difference is not inherent, but socially constructed, constructed he works off this counter narrative by um, further expressing that an admission of difference and a production of nationality consciousness at the level of identity is the facilitator of the development of contradictions. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's important to notice the shift in the approach to contradictions um, because in, in the past, you know, there's this idea that there are antagonistic contradictions or Diwul Maudwin, which cannot achieve anything positive. But then there are these non-antagonistic contradictions or um, which are transformative and, and can be celebrated. But, but in, this, in this telling, really any kind of difference is, is bad and potentially explosive. <clears throat> okay, um, so again, there, there are um, proposed endings to the point provisions and some places have already um, canceled the point provisions for ethnic minorities. The um, preparatory programs are still continuing, continuing um, and there are more boarding schools and um, Navy Ban that are being promoted. Okay, we can make um, one contrast between affirmative action and preferential policies and that's the basis so um, notice again that in this piece in the South China Morning Post, um, they also refer to the preferential policies as affirmative action. Um, so policy provides a kind of description of an outcome and affirmative action really expresses that there's some kind of um, affirmative or positive action that has to be taken in order to counter discrimination. Um, and there's a recognition of racial discrimination in the, the title, affirmative action. Preferential policies as a descriptor is a bit different. It expresses that in order for development of these poor Western areas to occur, some preference must be shown. Um, with regard to higher education in the US, the achievement of diversity has really replaced affirmative action as a policy rationale. So it's no longer about group-based structural discrimination um, and states can ban affirmative action for university admission consideration. Also universities in the US cannot make a point or quota system, which is in China central to how the policy measures work. Everything is based on points and quotas and allocation of slots. Um, in China, the name of the policy tells you something about the approach. So they're called preferential policies the idea is that in order to develop minority autonomous areas and to train um, and to train groups of people to train minorities, they need to be given preference. The focus is on development. There isn't an overt acknowledgement of discrimination. 
So if the context of tension in the US is about racial animus in China, it's connected to a fear of separatism and then policy arguments to dismantle or reconfigure the preferential policies are connected to this fear. You know, will there be greater unity if there are some accommodations or not? Um, the question of how to prevent devastating contradictions is always linked to the preferential policies, whether they maintain or dismantle or reconfigure the policy measures is connected to this question. Um, and and, um, and they, they could come to an end. There is an imagined endpoint for them. Um, so there's a similar dynamic between these two symptoms, these two systems, <laughs> symptoms, these two systems, they're subject to political winds and fluctuations. Um, and just as the Trump administration took up new challenges to affirmative action in the US. Um, similarly, in China, some eligible categories for the preferential policy measures have been retracted and um, some point provisions have been eliminated. And then of course, the situation in Xinjiang from 2017 undercuts policy on uh, minority autonomy and rhetoric on diversity. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for this. And um, I will um, start us off with a question. In the context of the coronavirus pandemic in particular, uh, we have come to find it normal to talk about a kind of, let's say, systemic rivalry between, you know, I don't know, China and the US in particular, and one handling the, the situation well and one badly. And then kind of using, if you like this, uh, this discussion of contradictions, one contradiction that I find really intriguing is, you know, um, um, Marong's vision of, uh, of, of the second generation uh, nationalist policy is explicitly modeled on the US. And, um, and, you know, from my perspective, this kind of thing that was great about socialism was um, this sort of multinational vision of, uh, of, of, of the polity that goes back to the sort of, you know, this is probably what this fellow was talking about, sort of like uh, Ottoman Empire, Austrian Empire, sort of, we're all, we can, we can all, we can have multinational flourishing under the same sovereign. Uh, whereas a move towards um, this kind of one nation is one mm -hmm. state kind of French model, which has an inherently right, genocidal right. logic, to it <laughs> uh, is what China's moving towards. So it seems very odd that China's like, we're so proud to have this Chinese model, which is just like America, and we will give up on socialism and 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 pursue a bourgeois notion of, of the nation state. And is there any, I don't know, self-awareness of that contradiction in, in China or among these social theorists? Um, well, first of all, I, I don't think that um, everything Marwan wanted to do was really adopted. So the second generation is is um, our Hu Hu Angang and Hu Lianhe who came a bit later. And actually, Marwan has a lot of criticisms about the second generation policy. Um, so yeah, his, so his although he says that he's inspired by the U.S., um, a lot of academics and and politicians have criticized him. And, and said, you know, we can't be like the US, we are, we are China and we are going to achieve this um, in our own way with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> so that's really what he's often criticized for. Um, and I, I mean, there's a whole raft of criticisms of him and he's responded to a, a lot of them. Um, but I do agree with you that, that the China model is very similar to um, the French model. <laughs> So I, I think that there is this sense that um, maybe there was a kind of flirting with the idea that that diversity could um, bring about some some kind of um, unity and, and equality. But in the end, I think people have have decided no. Instead, we're just going to achieve equality by everybody being the same <laughs> and not having identifiable differences. So. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you could say, you know, in France, if if you can't wear a hijab uh, because you stand out in public space, well, um, 
you know, China, maybe, maybe they'll do the same thing, but I, I don't think they're going to see themselves as inspired by France either. <laughs> well, maybe just very specifically, I, I particularly found, and I don't know if it's Ma wrong or not, but this like, oh, oh we, we've looked at the anthropological literature and it turns out that, you know, nationality is always this sort of imagined construction that, that, that leads to sort of, uh, right. you know, um, splittist notions of solidarity. Well, why wouldn't yes. that be true of the Zhonghua Minzu? You know, that's, like, like the, well, the, I think the idea is, is you can, you can, if it's true that it's constructed, then why don't we construct one? You know, why don't we construct some superordinate culture that everybody can be a part of? Um, I mean, obviously, everybody can't be a part of it, and that's the problem. <laughs> and it sort of takes, you know, this, this, the, the, the state. I don't know, as a, as an organizational form, the nation state as a, as a moral good in and of itself, I guess. Yeah, there and there were so many discussions. I mean, I don't know how many policymakers should listen to these discussions, but there were a lot of, of forums at um Yang Min and at, at uh, IUAES, the, the International Union of Anthropological Science. I mean, they had a lot of discussions about um, the danger of these kinds of, of thinking and, and discussions about what had happened to indigenous people and peoples in Canada and in, in, in America's um, when how they were there was genocide and how how terrible it was and and please you know for China not to follow the same direction um but you know I I don't know maybe some people took it the other way to say well you know maybe we can have unity if we just all speak Putonghua and I mean certainly if you just yeah. l look at certain you know young people on the internet I've seen people say like oh you know America killed all its indigenous peoples and it got rich so maybe we should give it a try A lot of the students, at least to me, would just say that they were glad that they had the opportunity to go to college. Um, and some of them were, you know, the first in their families to be able to do so. So, so they thought it was great that they could go. Some people thought it was um, like a waste of time, but that it was that it was necessary in order to go to, to university. Um, and some, you know, some people thought, well, we have a lot of free time, we can just have fun, you know, we don't have to study that hard. There were some students who did have to study hard, um, who may have had um, trouble linguistically or, or with some of their subjects, and so they did have to study harder. So, um, yeah, so there's quite, quite a range. I, I um, had read in one book, I mean, I think it's much more um, fraught in Xinjiang. I think it has been much more fraught in Xinjiang, um, where, you know, Min Kao Min and Min Kao Han, the, the people who test in, um, in, in Chinese and the people who test in a minority language, it almost takes on the level of an identity. Um, so there was, I was reading in, um, a book by Timothy Gross that, um, some of the students complained that, they were disadvantaged, um, that they could have maybe gone directly to university, but they had to go through these remedial classes. Um, and I didn't hear that so much in Qinghai, but it is true that students will, when they, when they fill out their um, forms, their application forms for a university, um, you know, they have, to, they have to apply to a category. And so, you can kind of hedge your bets and say you want to go to the preparatory program, but maybe if you had a few points more and you didn't calculate it uh, correctly, maybe you could have gone directly to university, but you missed your chance and you had to spend this extra year because you chose the, the preparatory program instead. Others are very strategic about it. So for example, um, maybe they want to get into a higher ranked university. And so instead they could go directly to a lower ranked university, like an Arben university, but they will instead opt to go to the preparatory program of, a, of an Iban, Iban university, a, a top tier um, university. So they spend an extra year or two, but they get a more prestigious degree in the end. I have the impression just again from sort of, I don't know, anecdotal chatter 
that in terms of the 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 I don't know, normal normal peoples by which I mean Chinese people's understanding of this preferential system, uh, mm -hmm. some Minzu are sort of more problematic than others. So like you you hear the Manchus talked about a lot. It's like well no one's really Manchu anyhow, and so anyone who is right. Manchu just pretends to be Manchu in order to get points. Whereas, uh, whereas uh, you know, maybe some Hani who lives in Yunnan in a tree or something, he, that's okay if they get some extra points. I've heard a lot of things like that. Um, but I assume that actually Manchus don't get extra points. And, um, but anyhow, can you just talk a little bit about this sort of the, 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 the let's say, like the ideological status of different uh, nationalities in public discourse on, on these questions? Uh, a lot of places where, um, where the group doesn't, speak um, their own language, well, with the exception of the Hui. Um, and in, in some areas, they don't have Yucaban at all. So so a lot, a lot of those don't apply. But it's true that there is resentment about this kind of group-based privileges that, you know, my neighbor had the same education as me, but, you know, she has this chance and I don't. Um, I did meet um, a, a student, I'm trying to think she, what group she was. She was Oh, Iwinki? Is that, am I saying that right? Oh, Iwinki. Oh, Iwinki. Oh, Yeah, she, um, she had gone to the Yukaban and, and actually it wasn't, she got in as a Yuka student, but then I think she didn't actually have to go through a program. And she, she expressed a little guilt to me about it. You know, she said, well, someone like me, you really shouldn't, have the opportunity of this of this program, but I did. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's definitely. Um, but but even for for groups that are at some disadvantage, there's still a kind of resentment there, um, and I think that that really has more to do with just a lack of interaction. You know that that some of the people criticizing uh, these people have never they've never had any interactions with them. Yeah, they have to do that. And and the students from, you know, from the West might not know about that university, so they might not write it down, or it might be too expensive um, or, le and, or less desirable to attend. So, but yeah, yeah, that's, they do everything on a um, allocation slot, slot based system. The privilege uh, left to me is to, um, is uh, to thank, uh, Naomi for giving this uh, really interesting talk. So uh, let's all, I don't know, clap for Naomi and, uh, and thank her for being with us today. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, it was good to, to be remotely with all of you as well.